the story, and today's part of the story is about prophets, about paying attention when people warn you that something bad is going to happen. Uh, last year, I got to go to the beautiful city of Pompeii, and around Pompeii, as you know, they found a lot of people who did not pay attention to the warning signs that were about to take place. You see, before Pompeii was wiped out, two other towns had already been wiped out. All the wells around Pompeii had dried up and were really hot. And then the bay that Pompeii was near was bubbling with heat and fish were dying. And the mountain was quaking. They had all kinds of warning signs that something really bad was going to take place. But a lot of people, as you can see from this guy, did not pay attention to the warning. I still remember seeing uh, one guy that they found like this, and they discovered him on the toilet, uh, just sitting with his hands like this, like, oh, no, this is a bad day. Okay. Uh, we're not good at warnings. Uh, the Lusitania, as you know, was sunk at the beginning of World War I. And the very newspaper that announced the Lusitania was sailing, right next to it was a big gigantic ad from the Germans saying, we're going to be sinking any ships that go to England. Uh, the guy who was in charge of the Lusitania was told to zigzag in case of submarines, but he thought that was silly. He didn't pay attention, and again, he was sunk. And think about how often we have been warned about things and not paid attention. Uh, anybody seen this sign at your workplace? Uh, to avoid injury, don't tell me how to do my job. It's a great little warning. Today, we're going to be talking about men called prophets. How God calls us to a different way of life, and yet do we pay attention to the words of prophets? Reminds me of Jesus' words. Read those with me. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Now, when we are going the wrong direction, we need to pay attention to God. To pay attention to the warning signs of the prophets around us. Or as Martin Luther said, all of the Christian life is one of repentance. Our sinful nature is always taking us the wrong direction. We're always needing to come back to where God is calling us to be. So our lesson 15 of the story of the Bible and if you haven't read the story yet, I've got a bunch more stories in there. Feel free to take one as you leave. It's the story of the Bible, as you might say, a novel. And we need to understand the story of God to understand our place here. And so where we're at today, the big idea, God sends prophets to call Israel to do what? To repent. repent. But they were largely ignored. Jesus is God's great prophet. And I pray that you will listen, not ignore his words of repentance and God's grace. Or as uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews said, read this with me. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in his last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So it's, this is kind of a long sermon, so kind of relax, and we're going to be looking at the prophets today. And the prophets are especially known in the time period where there are two different kingdoms. And when I went to church, nobody ever told me that for hundreds of years there were two different kingdoms in the Bible. I got really confused. There's a kingdom called Israel and a kingdom called Judah. Israel is ten tribes of the Jewish nation, and Judah is two. And they broke up, as we learned last week, over a guy named Rehoboam trying to raise the taxes, and how ten tribes rebelled against Rehoboam and formed their own nation. And during uh, this time period, there's a bunch of kings. And when you came in, you got a piece of paper. It's time for your test. Have you memorized it? Take it out, so by your pew. Okay, we're going to see how many of the kings of Judah and Israel you know. But take a look at this piece of paper, because this will show you that the two nations had two different sets of kings. And if a king isn't red or orange, he's kind of evil. So how many good kings are there in the nation of Israel? Can maybe see how many good kings there are? There are none. Israel, for this entire time it was there, did not have one good king godly king. The blue are the different prophets sent to Israel. 
to warn them to repent. And then eventually, as you'll learn, the nation of Israel is destroyed by the Assyrians. Judah has many good kings and a few not so good ones. And again, God sent prophets to them also. And so we have in the story of God these prophets, these men of God. And they are there to warn people about God's judgment when it comes to doing evil things. And uh, some people ask me, what is the prophet? And a prophet in the Old Testament is someone who is used by God to communicate his message to the world. And right now in a confirmation class, I'm talking about how God speaks to us. And I have this one little girl who says, uh, Pastor, I don't know if God exists or not. I go home and I ask God to say something to me. I ask God to give me proof that he exists. And nothing happens. And so guess what I have to try to teach that young girl? And this is really hard because uh, the young girls like to listen very well. <laughs> Not so much. That God does speak to us. But how he speaks to us now is through this book. This book is like a radio. If you want God to speak to you, you have to be in this book and letting this book communicate to you. And so the prophets of the Old Testament spoke prophecies to us. And we can read those prophecies. And these prophets in the Old Testament were called by God. Very, very few of these men said, I want to be a prophet. No, they're like Jeremiah. God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet. And so these prophets in the story are men and women called directly by God. And they write their prophecies. And this is something you need to understand that the Bible is put together according to categories. You have all the historical books in one place, books of wisdom, and then the books of the prophets, uh, major and minor prophets. And these prophets were told to speak their message very, very accurately. Again, look at 1 Kings 22. As surely as the king lives, I tell the king only what the Lord tells me. So called by God, speaking accurate messages. And then the prophets would wear things to set them apart as being different kinds of people. Elijah was known for wearing garments of hair and a leather belt around his waist. Where have we seen another guy dressing kind of strange about the same way? Anybody remember? John the baptizer. Again, a prophet. Elijah wears this mantle. Ezekiel shaves his head and beard. Prophets have a unique appearance about them. And then you wouldn't want to be a prophet because prophets led a hard life. None of the prophets got rich and powerful and an easy life. Isaiah is eventually murdered. Ezekiel suffers as he speaks to rebellious people. Elijah Several attempts against his life. Jeremiah is thrown into an empty well. Prophets had these very, very difficult lives. And then finally, in the Old Testament, there's mention of false prophets. And we'll see them in the story that we're looking at today. These false prophets of God. So what does this all have to do with you? Well, uh, Paul wrote in Timothy, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but what? Test the spirits to see if they are from God, because there's lots and lots of false prophets. And if you go home today and turn on your radio and TV, is everybody in the radio and TV going to be a real prophet, or will there be some false prophets there? Uh, my guess is you're going to find some false prophets. When you come here to church, should you trust everything I say? And the answer is what? No, because no, I could be a false prophet. You need to compare whatever you learn from a Bible teacher with, guess which book? The Bible. This is your source of truth. Compare what you hear with the scriptures. Know that they're all false prophets out there. So this idea of prophets is very, very important to us. So we have these things, these guys and women called prophets, called accurate, unique, suffering. And a warning that there are false prophets out there. And these prophets are dealing with those kings of Israel. Again, take a look at that piece of paper once again. A lot of those kings are pretty what? 
bad. And so God sends these prophets to these kings, like Jeremiah. And look what Jeremiah said. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the things that you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. And often we don't want to reform our ways, our actions, and obey God. But God continues to come to us with these prophets. And we see a great story of prophets in the story of a guy named Elijah and an evil king named Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Uh, take a look at these pictures. To worship the god Baal, which Ahab and Jezebel are worshiping, you would literally, as I said before, sacrifice children alive into a fire. Okay, we're talking about Baal worship. It is a very, very evil type of worship that killed thousands and thousands of children in a very, very terrible way. And so Elijah is sent to Ahab and Jezebel and says, you have abandoned the Lord's commandments, you have followed the Baals. Bring your prophets and meet me somewhere. Meet me at this place called Mount Carmel and we will have a contest to see which God is true. And look at the last part of our text. If the Lord is God, then what? Follow him. But if Baal is God, do what? Follow him. And look what the Bible says. But the people said, what? Nothing. And so often we too are uh, apathetic when it comes to making a decision for God or not for God. And you know the story. The 450 prophets of Baal show up. They build an altar. And Elijah shows up, the real prophet. And the prophets of Baal begin to wail and cut themselves and cry out to Baal to answer them. And Elijah says, where is your God? Maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he's on vacation. Nothing is happening. And again, I love how it's described. Oh, Baal, answer us. And it says at the bottom, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. And that is what happens when you're worshiping an idol. It doesn't help you at all. Elijah then takes water. Three times he covers the sacrifice with water. And then he speaks and fire comes down. And the people say that the God of Israel is God. And then God's judgment comes upon Ahab and Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. And we need to remember that someday will God's judgment come down to this world. And the answer is, yes, it will. But on that judgment day, we will not have to worry. Because God's judgment against our sins has already fallen someplace. And where it fell is on the cross. This is where your judgment came. The fate you deserve was taken on by Jesus Christ. He suffered and died for you. And yet God is still frustrated, though, with the people. With the people who do not pay attention to his word. That he is the king of Israel. That he is the redeemer. That there is no one like him. As it says here, no, there is no other rock. I know not one. And the, the prophets warn God's people to repent. To go the right way. And has anybody ever seen this little sign here that says, I see why? I'm going to stand for I see why what? Okay. Okay. Have you noticed they put that sign up in the wintertime? That sign is a warning. How many of you have not paid attention to that warning and find yourself skidding the wrong direction? I know I have. Okay. We need to pay attention to the warning signs. And that's what the prophets are. They're warning us that we can have idols in our own lives. So how do you know if you have an idol in your own life? Well, when you have an idol in your heart, you tend to get emotional, angry, depressed, or anxious if that idol is threatened like the prophets of Baal. So let's say I went around today and took all of your cell phones and said, you know what? I'm giving these back to you in a month. Okay, are you going to be angry, depressed, and anxious? Especially if you're a teenager, right? Okay, and why is that? Because our cell phones have, for many of us, become our idols. 
And you can do with anything else. So what if it was taken away from you would make you angry? That might be your idol. Look at your priorities. Where does your time and money go? That's probably your idol. Martha had an idol. That was her house. And so when Jesus came, she didn't stop to sit at Jesus' feet. And Jesus, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen a good portion which will not be taken away from her. Take your look with God. Is your walk with God growing or going down? It could be idols in your life. And God gets very, very frustrated with our idols. We don't have time to go through all this, but Isaiah 44 talks about how people were taking a piece of wood, burning half of it, and then worshiping the other half. And I want you to take a look at how frustrated God is with people's idols. This is the direct word of God. He warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I see the fire. From the rest, this is wood. He makes a God his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me. You are my God. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. Their minds closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I use for fuel. I even made bread over its coals. I roast meat and I ate it. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a people feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing my right hand a lie? And so know that all of us here, pastors included, it's so easy to let idols take part of our lives. And those idols frustrate God, and they eventually hurt us when we're worshiping something more than the creator of the universe. And by the way, in the last day of your life, what are you going to really value? What matters when life comes to an end is who are you with God? Do you stand in a place where judgment has already fallen? Have you lived a life of loving and serving other people? That is what matters. So in the lower story, we are vulnerable of the same sins of Judah and Israel. We too can make idols in our lives. And so what does God want to do with us, us idol makers? And there's one last story about a prophet, a guy named Hosea. And Hosea was told to marry a promiscuous woman. And this woman represented God's people, chasing after other people. He married her, and she went off and messed around with other men. And eventually got herself thrown into slavery. And what is Hosea told to do? He's told to purchase her back. Go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by other men and is adulterous. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. And even though we have all worshipped other gods, we have been idol worshippers so often. What has God done? God continues to send us a message of love and mercy and grace. That he comes and he pays for our idolatry with his precious blood to purchase us back to be his children. So, as you're going through the story, you'll run across these prophets of God, called, accurate, unique, suffering, warning us about false prophets. And when God's prophets come to you, I pray that you will not ignore their warnings, but that you will listen to the words of Jesus and follow him and live in his love and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.